All right. Well, I hope uh, all of you are having a, a productive week. Not too much rowdiness going on. I know the back row is that's an exception. I understand that. <laughs> But it is good to see all of you this evening and our visitors as well. It's nice to have you with us. We are in the fifth chapter of First Peter, and this is the final lesson in this study. This is lesson number 54 in this study in First Peter. As I said, uh, the first century church went through a lot of tribulation and a lot of persecution. Two really powerful rounds of it. Uh, all of the uh, uh, saints in that day when you got saved especially for the Jewish people. Um, they got so much flack from their Jewish family members, the community, the businesses, uh, and eventually, of course, they were of course, pushed out of the temple. They could not worship with the Jewish people. They, did, they wanted to worship with the Jewish <coughs> people, and so we worshiped on the first day of the week as the early church did. And, uh, but a lot of them lost their businesses, and a lot of them lost their lives because in that day when you accepted Christ as your Savior, uh, you became an object of scorn so much so that uh, many of them were put to death, used as excuses for uh, tragedies that happened, and uh, even Nero uh, accused the Christians of starting the insurrection and the problem uh, in, the, in the nation, in his kingdom, uh, the Roman Empire. And he used to set these believers and strap them to stakes and put tar and pitch on them and set them on fire at nighttime just to light the road into the city of Rome and other places as well. Uh, they made fun of them. They used them uh, in the most degrading way. And so this was written actually from Babylon, uh, as you'll see as we get to the end, as we noted in our first lesson. And Peter was ministering to the saints there. And uh, all those who were in Christ uh, needed to be built up in the faith where they would have confidence that God would see them through, that their suffering would not be forgotten by God, uh, that God's vengeance would eventually uh, take care of the evildoers, um, maybe not in their lifetime, uh, but certainly in the end, uh, they were to see the big game, the big picture, not just you know, what I'm suffering in this life, and I would call this undeserved suffering as others have before me, uh, and how you respond to when you're treated wrongfully and you do the right thing, as an old saying goes, uh, no good deed goes unpunished, and sometimes that's the way it goes around when you're trying to do the right thing to help folks, and certainly to share the light of the gospel and how to be saved and how to know Christ as your Savior. Uh, they, they, the, even so much so that Many of the Jewish people, uh, the leaders especially in, the, in their own Jewish government, the Sanhedrin, uh, they would accuse the Christians of an insurrection against the Roman government so as to stir up, stir up a stink to get the government to agree with them on punishing uh, the Christians to round them up. And that's what Saul of Tarsus was doing when the Lord knocked him off his high horse on the road to Damascus. And then he was once uh, the predator and then he became the prey when he got saved. And so as I've said many times, we are behind enemy lines. We may not look at ourselves as combatants, but Satan does. Uh, he's our arch enemy. He's real. And he's believed to have been real ever since the Garden of Eden with the first people put on this planet. And uh, he introduced a sin and disobedience into the world. And Adam and Eve didn't have to take him up on it, uh, but they did. And of course, as a result, we have the problems that we have. They're multifaceted. But nonetheless, uh, there is grace by God to deal with it. And that's what's wonderful. Whatever your circumstance is, God's grace can handle it. His non-meritorious system of favor and blessing and providing, uh, it can handle it. And always remember that He is He's not up there. He's with you. He's in you. It's not like He's taking a vacay uh, on the beach in the third heavens. He's with you right now. He's in you. And so uh, his word that you get helps you become more adapted to his perspective and seeing life and its unfairness at times as this book brings out. 
His Word gives you the eyeballs of God uh, to see things from a bigger picture than what CNN or Fox or anybody else gives you their purview of what's going on in the world today. And, of course, not even taking into consideration the changes that we're dealing with in our culture. Uh, our grandparents, much less our parents, would not, rec would not recognize our nation today. And us seniors certainly have seen a lot of change that we can't believe what's happening. But it is, and so we're not to be so overly concerned with it because sinners do what sinners do best, sin. And uh, this is not a strike on sinners because we're all sinners, but those who are saved, they find their faith and their hope in a higher, higher being, and that's God, rather than mankind. The world listens to itself. It's its own echo chamber. The philosophies, the ideas, they just bounce off the world's walls and they go no further. Whether it's false religion or just religion as a way to step into the presence of God apart from Christ, which is can't work. Uh, but anyway, we listen to the Word. We believe it's a living Word of God. We don't believe that it's a dead book that's 2,000 years old. We believe it's a living Word. And we believe it's just as pertinent today as it was 2,000 years ago, much less 8,000 years ago. So I entitled this lesson, Accepting Our Lot in Life. I, do, I don't put that in the notes there. So I've got the PowerPoint notes for tonight on there. This was some of the leftovers from Sundays. Uh, I like leftovers. Had some for supper. They were very good. <laughs> Beef stroganoff. Oh, my word, that was good. Yes. <laughs> I'll probably get mad cow disease now from eating that stuff. <laughs> but we noted in that last lesson, in verses 8 and 9, just to bring us up to speed to finish off this last lesson, uh, humble yourselves, verse 6, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that's we accept His authority and His Word is a part of that, for the purpose that He may lift you up, exalt you in due time. Now is really not the time. Later on will be the time. Casting all of your anxiety or your cares upon Him, that's not an easy task to do because that requires a lot of faith. Casting all your care upon Him for He cares for you. He surrounds you as we saw in the original language in the Greek. The word careth, peri, means to surround. He cares for you. He hadn't gone anywhere. Be sober. This has been clear-minded. Be on your toes. Be vigilant. As I said last week, we're not vigilant if we're just vigilant some of the time. That's not vigilance. Like I said, it's like watching a toddler around an area where you have a swimming pool. You've got to be vigilant. That means eyes on all the time. Or tie them to a tree or something. Whatever. But protect the child. They don't know any better. And a lot of Christians don't know any better. They just stray away from God. But we're to be sober, we're to be vigilant because we have an adversary. The devil. Now, he's not omnipresent, but he has principalities and powers that rule under his authority and they make it their business to find out a positive Christian who loves the Lord and is trying to be a good Christian. They know after watching you over your life, your proclivities to whatever it's the self-righteous crowd or the gutter crowd or everything in between, they know by your actions how to try to trip you up. They know that. And of course your sin nature, that's yours. And it it's pulling you back too all the time. There's a constant warfare as we see in Galatians chapter 5 between the spirit and the flesh. But our adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, he he's constantly stalking, seeking to devour. And the answer to that is to resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that those same undeserved sufferings, those same afflictions that you're going through, they are also being accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So they're getting along. They're making it difficult as it may be for them. Uh, they're, they're staying upright, spiritually speaking. So... All believers have difficult circumstances, as I wrote in my notes here in, the, in my Bible. 
all believers have difficult circumstances to deal with, whether it's health, uh, marital, uh, finances, societal. All, all believers have some, something that they're dealing with. We, we get that. So that was the notes that we had. With God, nothing is strange. And I do some of this and say some of this because some of the people that listen online, this goes all over the world. You wouldn't think it was, but it goes, whoever picks up the, tries to find out something, uh, there are people who listen and they don't see your notes. But with God, nothing is strange. and We must not mistake the working of God in our daily lives as being mere coincidence. Something happens, you say, why did that person come into my life? Why did this event work out the way that it worked out? If you're God's child, you receive Christ as your Savior sometime in your life. God is using you, He's with you, and He's steering you in a place where His light needs to be shined. Vigilance is possible only to those who have a mind prepared with God's Word. And I noted last week that we're not vigilant if we're just vigilant some of the time. we be on our toes. There are a lot of believers who when things are going so well for them, they start to slip off. That's not vigilance. Vigilance is having this determined mindset that, you know, and you're not trying to straighten out the world. That's not our job. Only God is the general manager of the universe. But we're trying to be a good influence as much as we can. We're not going to be perfect. That's where 1 John 1, 9 is, where we can confess our sin, and He wipes the slate clean as a whistle. It doesn't change our relationship with God, but it makes it possible for us to have fellowship one with another, Him. Satan wants us to forsake God's support system of the Word, and he wants us to forsake the local church, which is actually, it's the cafeteria for the saints. It's the training place. Not the only place, but it is ordained of God that it be so in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 through 16 and of course 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus there's a purpose for it Satan wants us to forsake God's support system of the word in the local church and Satan wants to do that because like a flock of sheep he always looks for that one that's left the flock it's a sheep it's not a goat it's a sheep and it decides well this looks interesting over here or that looks interesting over there. And the next thing you know, uh, the Word is the shepherd's voice. The under-shepherd who gets his commandment from the Word and the shepherd, the shepherd's voice is so distant that that sheep can't hardly hear even where the flock is any longer. And, boy, that's easy pickings for the lion, that roaring lion. It's humiliating. It's humbling. But the Lord says that's how you function in the divine system. You function through humility. Humble yourselves therefore in the mighty hand of God, the authority of God, which that's a picture of. In the Old Testament, it was the horn. In the tabernacle, it was the, the horns. That was the sign of the authority. But biblical sobriety repels worldly intoxications. There's a lot of worldly intoxications. I'm not talking about spirits, the drinking kind. I'm just talking about there are a lot of things that people are just so in love with. The love of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And we have to watch those intoxicants because they are powerful. Uh, the Greg Goreo is the word for vigilant. It means to be attentive. We're to be attentive. Vigilance is constant or it's not vigilance, as I said. We've got to be convinced that letting down our guard against the world is a dangerous thing. A lot of Christians are convinced of that. It is a dangerous thing. And then when a frog is, is cooking the pot, they don't start to, the water is boiling hot, you'd hop out, he would probably try to pop out of it. They started very comfortable, and get a little bit more comfortable, until the frog gets all sleepy eyed, you know, and then finally he's just laying there doing a backstroke. The next thing you know is he goes off to sleep, next thing you know, they're eating his little legs, you know. <laughs> don't want that. Satan uses people to scare us into submission to him. Remember, he's a roaring lion. The roar does not hurt. The roar is to scare you. He is the consummate bully. And he uses people to do his deeds. And there are people who will try to scare you into not being a witness for Christ. They are bullies. They are Satan's minions. They'll do what they can. They don't realize it, but that's what they're doing. 
It's the bite that gets you, not the roaring. <laughs> we must allow God to grow His love in us so strongly that we do not allow man to intimidate us into hiding our witness. We're not given permission to be in a witness protection program. We live our Christian life. We don't beat people over the head with the Bible. We just live the Christian life. We talk the Christian talk. It's like everybody else gets a chance to talk their talk. You know. So, we get ours. And that's the last thing I have here before we go tonight. The philosophy of the cosmic system. That's Satan's war against God. The way he, he sets up a campaign. He has a campaign against God. He's had it ever since before the earth was created. Actually, since the earth was created, we want to get into all that tonight. But before God created man, Lucifer fell from grace because he became came proud, he became jealous that the angels were ascending and descending up into the heavens, bringing glory to God. And he wanted to get him some of that. He got too big for his britches, as they say. And God judged him, and he judged his habitation as well. But the philosophy of Satan's cosmic, it's an orderly, the word cosmic means orderly. Satan's war on God is driven by demoting the divinity of God and God's holiness and replacing this with the alleged dignity and self-esteem of humanity. So it becomes from a Christocentric or a theocentric world where we listen to God's voice to becoming an anthropocentric, man-centered voice, man's wisdom, and all that goes with that. Well, I'm going to tell you, when you leave this world, those folks aren't going to be able to do a thing for you. I don't care how good a scientist or philosopher they are. They're not going to do one hour for you. But Jesus gave His life for us. And He's waiting on us. And when the time's right, He's coming to fetch us. Or we're going to meet Him first, whichever it happens. And we have faith in that. His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that that's true. Every believer is influenced by Satan's system and the Influenced, not possessed, but influenced. There's influences everywhere, and they got their tentacles in all of us to a certain degree. So the Word of God is our only defense against getting hooked into that. All right, here we go. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you'll help us to go through this lesson as we close out this book and this study. We thank you for the lessons learned. We pray that all of us from time to time will be able to pull out some of the notes that we've had review some of the things as we read through this wonderful epistle written by this dedicated servant of the Lord. We thank you now for what you provided for us in time, what you do for us that we cannot do for ourselves, how you look beyond our circumstances and know what's ahead for us and we just walk by faith in that understanding. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would strengthen us and our faith be with those who can't be with us who are afflicted and sick. We ask you to heal them, bring them back into the fold with us so that we can fellowship and rejoice together with them. We thank you now for this privilege of sharing the word, and we ask that you bless it to our understanding and for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. So we get to the end of this letter, verses 10 through 14. And we find Peter, what he is doing, he is preparing his flock for whatever may come their way. And Second Peter, he doubles up on that or doubles down on that. And Second Peter, knowing suffering would be a way of life for the faithful, he instructs those believers to be on their toes regarding the world that they live in. They could not afford to go to sleep while, with, while Satan was stalking them. He knew suffering would make them weak in the knees. Peter did. Because he experienced that himself at our Lord's trial, remember? That they would be tempted to give in to the peer pressure that would come their way by their families, by their community, by their social mores, all the things that would be a part of that. Giving in to the philosophies of the cosmic system that Satan's system of antagonism toward God, giving in to that would diminish the glory of God in their lives. Now, it never diminishes the glory of God. There's a kind of glory of God cannot be diminished. It is immutable. But we are reflectors of His glory. When we live the life that we should live, we are reflectors of His glory. And so we don't want 
that little bit of reflection that we have wherever you live to be diminished by faithlessness. Life is too short and eternity is too long to waste time chasing worldly ambitions that you're going to leave every last one behind. Every last one. As I've said before, I've never seen a U-Haul fall on a hearse. That to me, there's nothing wrong with having something. That's not the point. But some things have the people. It's good for us to have things, but it's bad when that has us. And we have to be careful of that. For that we would have some sort of confidence because we're in such good health that we can just do whatever we want. We've got so much money, we can just do whatever we want. We've got so much popularity, we can do just whatever we want. God can cut that off in a split second through our circumstances. And we know that. Solomon was the wealthiest man probably would ever be on the planet. And he spent 20 years chasing his tail. He spent 20 years uh, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, the Epicurean philosophy of life. Until he finally came to an end where he realized, I've got all this stuff, but I don't, I don't, I don't enjoy life. He had, as we've heard before, he had all the advantage, but he didn't have the capacity to appreciate it. So eternity is too long of a time to waste chasing worldly ambitions at the expense of building a good, sweet, strong fellowship with the Lord and His people. We have to learn to live in that realm. As Christians, we get more comfortable with our intellect and with our flesh, and we kind of live in a fog when it comes to our spiritual realm. That, that becomes a problem. So, we'll just do the big old target thing here. I just won't do it too big. And we have the body, the soul, and the spirit. The human spirit. I'll say that human spirit. And then the Holy Spirit. His spirit bears witness with our spirit. So, this was dead until you got saved, and once you got saved, your human spirit was quick and brought back to life, and the Holy Spirit took up residence with this spirit realm, and your soul, your emotions, your mentality, your conscience, your self-consciousness, and your human will, that is the part of you that's made after the essence of God, or after the image of God, excuse me. And the body, well, the old sin nature reigns in the body. And it's trying to constantly influence you with the outside world. And it has its own types of sins and things that it can influence us with. But for the believer, when we are in God, God is trying to get through the ear gate or the eye gate to get into your intellect, to get into your human will, to speak to your human spirit that understands spiritual things. When I was in college, I had a professor who dealt in quantifying everything. He wrote a book on it. It's in my library. I keep it in the back where I'll keep everything that's got cobwebs on it. <laughs> but I had to study that book, and it's how to grow your church from the cradle all the way through the seniors, all the way up to uh, <laughs> going out of this world. And he ended up becoming the president of that one school. But the whole idea was that we had to get this energized. We had to get people excited. Here's so much of what happens in churches today. They put so much jizzle into the service that you start sensing that the glands in your body that produce this epinephrine or all the other cortisol and all the other uh, adrenaline hormones that you have, that that somehow or another is a moving of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God moves here. And then works it back out through your soul. And gives you influence over so many things. The last place that the Spirit of God works is in your flesh. The first place He works is in your human spirit. His Spirit bears witness with your spirit. Not your soul and not your flesh. Once you got it and you get it, it's gone from your just your mind and your intellect. And you accept it by faith. It's called epinosis or higher knowledge of God. And it becomes spiritual knowledge. And from there... Then there's the release of the Spirit. There's the release of the, that knowledge as you 
think about it. And me- this is why we're supposed to meditate on the Word because we take it into our mind and then we start exercising it inwardly first. Too often when you're taught Christian ethics and when you're taught evangelism, you're taught that from doing things from the outward expressions. But it has to first start here uh, in our in our our spirit. But anyway, that's free of charge. I didn't throw that up there. But you've got circumstances to deal with, however difficult they may be. That you can bear them. God would not allow you to go into your circumstances if you couldn't bear them. And these people that Peter is helping here, many of them would face death. There would be a lot of martyrs between then and 70 A.D. and four and and afterward, especially. 70 A.D. was a breaking point. It happened later on as well through Domitian and others when John dealt with it. But the next life will be so much more honorable and rewarding, especially if we are trusting the Lord in our moments of time. So he says here, But the God of all grace, verse 10, who hath called us into this His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Okay, God's grace draws believers into God's eternal glory. And that means as soon as you receive Christ as Savior, you're already on, you've already got your reservation. You've already got your reservation. You're not going to lose your reservation. As we saw in chapter 1 and verse uh, 2, verses 4 and 5, that we've been called to an inheritance that's incorruptible, that's undefiled, that fades not away. It is reserved in heaven for you. He's reserving it. You who are kept, it's a military guard term, tereo, you who are kept by the power of God by means of faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the resurrection. So He's got you. But the God of all grace who has called us into His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, He says this, after you've suffered a while because He knew they were going to suffer. A lot of us don't really suffer so much as Christians in our country. I'm glad we don't. But He also, in that, in that suffering, that undeserved suffering, He helps to establish us and strengthen us and settle us down. So, all this grace from God is His non-meritorious favor that He shows to His child, and it is a grace to which no one can earn. That's something for sure. God's grace makes us whole and sustains us. Grace is God's unlimited resource in supplying any of our needs. Whatever your needs may be, He knows what it is. The God of all grace who has called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Not by our works, not by us being better than the person next to us, but by Christ Jesus. Grace is God's unlimited resource in supplying your needs. He bestows this grace, this unmerited favor upon those whom He has called. That's an aristocratic participle in the Greek text there, from the Greek word kaleo. He has called us out unto His eternal glory in Christ Jesus. He's done that. We had to respond. It's up to us to say yes. He doesn't make us say yes. He's called us out unto His eternal glory in Christ Jesus. Now just, that's a whole lot. Well, if we're earthly thinking, that doesn't mean a whole lot. But if we're heavenly thinking, what a great privilege to be called into the into a place where we're going to have a home in the third heavens. And of course we'll have our millennial kingdom thing here on earth, but then there's to be the new heavens and the new earth one of these days. But He's called us out into His eternal glory in Christ Jesus, the Bible says. His grace, His unmerited favor to the lost, He shows unmerited favor to the lost, the unsaved too. He shows patience. (laughs) Sometimes more than we would like. He shows long-suffering. You see, God has got a big stick of dynamite when it comes to His wrath, but He's got a really long fuse. What you have to be aware of is having a short fuse and a great big stick of dynamite. Moses was one of those who had a short fuse. There have been others in the Bible too, but Moses, it went off a few times. 
can happen. He's a sinner. Saved, but a sinner. But His grace to the lost is His patience, His long-suffering, His mercy. He keeps giving second and third and fourth and fifth or fifty chances for a person to believe in Christ. He's merciful. And He also offers the unsaved, as He did you and I, the message of the Gospel. He didn't have to do that. But God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. So God is gracious to the lost in that regard. And when you witness to the lost, you share the grace of God with them. So we have a high calling, seen in verse 10. We have an eternal destiny which we share because of Jesus Christ. He sees us in Christ and He sees Christ in us. The Bible says Christ in you, the hope of glory. The word hope, el means confidence. So you can be sure. He also sees the temporary suffering that you go through in Christ's name. Again, temporary in the sense that we're not going to be here forever. We've got to leave this place. We've already had a lot of people who are in our church over the years that have passed on there with the Lord now. Look forward to seeing them again. So the Lord sees the suffering that you go through before you ever go through it. And so He tries to prepare your heart and mind to deal with it because the worst thing you can have is for your mind to turn against you when you are in tribulation. It's one thing for people to turn against you, but when your mind gets turned against you, that's a, da- that's a bad thing. And yet while we may suffer, as He said, for a while because of our heritage in Christ, which is not uncommon, we do such. as we do such, God says He perfects you during that time. This doesn't mean He takes away your sin nature. But He's completing you. Making you more like Christ. That's the nearest active infinitive the word perfect is in the Greek text there for that word. Aorist tense is like the picture of the train that starts at the station here and goes through its journey and then ends here. Somewhere in there, God is maturing you and me. He's not done with us yet in other words. God perfects you. You don't perfect yourself. God does not give us the grace that we have suffered. God does not give us the grace after we have suffered a while. He gives us the grace as we suffer a while. The result of that undeserved suffering that comes with being a witness for the Lord coupled with the grace of God makes you katarizo. Perfect here. The word here for perfect uh, is the picture of mending fishing nets. He sews his back up where we come to become tattered as it were. That's one of the things that the fishermen would do after they went out fishing. Certainly Peter would be very well aware of that as a fisherman. Is spending a lot of time not catching fish but mending the nets. And I worked heavy construction the winter time when you couldn't get out because of the freeze and everything. We had a shop over next to Manita, and we would work on those Euclid dumps. We'd work on those uh, those bulldozers, all that heavy equipment, pulling the pistons out of them, taking tops out of them, the heads off of them, pulling the pistons out, putting new sleeves in. These are big pistons. Doing all this stuff, trying to get them ready for the work work season. Be putting new bull blades on them, all the things that you have to do to get them built up. You'd be doing all that kind of stuff. Uh, necessary to get it ready so that when it came time to go fishing or go to work uh, your, your equipment was ready to roll and you were ready to go with it so in this case when Peter is saying the word was used to describe mending fishing nets Galatians 6 1 translates this same word uh, when it comes to restoring a fallen believer who's gotten off the path to help them bring them back into union with God to help them kind of put their life back together. That's what He does for us. God allows undeserved suffering to mend the flaws in our character. This is another point that comes with this this analogy here for just a word. Some might say, how do you get so much out of it? Because when you look into the word and what the word, uh, the etymology of the word, the morphology of the word, you start seeing the things that the Holy Spirit was thinking when He gave this inspiration to Peter to write down. That's why you study those things. That's why these lessons seem like they take on forever. 
<laughs> but God allows suffering of all kinds to help mend the flaws in the nets of our character. We can always use some help along the way. Job learned this as an example, and he was considered to be the most righteous man in, on the earth at the time. Through undeserved suffering, God accomplishes His work of molding our character. Even if it causes us pain sometimes in our lives. He does that. We don't always appreciate it at the time. You know what the parent says, oh, this is going to hurt me more than it is you. Yeah, right. <laughs> Psalm 119, verse 67 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. So that means after I was afflicted, I got in line. <laughs> Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Then verse 71 of Psalm 119 says, It is good for me, after reflection, that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes, or understand thy statutes. It calls us to pause our life so that we can understand why we go through what we go through because it's worth it. It really is worth it. Our undetectable pride, so you and I can't see it in ourselves. Maybe some people can, but maybe we can't. Perhaps our self-assumed self-sufficiency is exposed through undeserved suffering. And when we turn to the Lord, then God replaces that self-sufficiency with His sufficiency. Pain is the only teacher that shows us our true selves in the way that we need to see ourselves. Satan said to God in chapter 2 of Job, Yeah, you took all of this good deed, all of this stuff, you allowed me to take his stuff away from him, his family, burned down his crops and everything, but now let me touch his flesh. And Satan said that a man will do whatever he can to protect his hide, and he'll curse you to your face when I touch his flesh. And God says, go ahead. Of course, God's omniscient. He knew the answer. He wasn't taking a chance with Job. He knew the answer. And Job, though he was misunderstood by so many, even his family, that was still left over, his wife in particular, and his friends, who were supposed to be friends, he found out who his friends were. He didn't have many. He found out what his money could have done for him. He didn't have any of that now. Of course, God brought him back up better than he ever was before, but God reduced him to ashes. But he never turned his back on the Lord. He never did, never did turn away from the Lord. Though he slay me, I'll not deny him. I'll not, I'll not swear to him, against him. So pain is a teacher that shows us our true selves in the way that we need to see ourselves. This is especially undeserved suffering. When Paul and Silas were thrown into prison, they just started singing. And they let their undeserved suffering for being in prison be expressed through rejoicing that at least they got to be punished because they were acting like Christians. It's different if you're punished if you're acting like a fool. First Peter chapter 4 says, don't let it be for that. But when you and I become helpless and weak, Paul said that's when he's the strongest. I'm not the strongest when I'm standing upright and rigid Got all that, I'm a can of corn and a bag of chips. It's when I'm reduced to ashes. It's when I sense that I'm more strong because in that vulnerability, I finally can hear the Lord. I finally can hear God. And as, he, as I hear Him, He starts to establish His mark on our lives. Favorable circumstances often diminishes our dependence on God's grace. We know that is a point. I've experienced that and witnessed that myself. Undeserved suffering builds a strong resolve to trust God. I tell you what, I'm going to pray more the next time. <laughs> I'm going to try to hang in there the next time. I'm going to try not to, not to do that again. Because He establishes us. He establishes us. Sterizo, S-T-E-R-I-Z-O. And that means He creates a resolve inside of us. The reason so many Christians are so up and down is because they do not have resolve in their conscience. God will put resolve in there. 
especially through undeserved suffering. He puts firm footing in your soul. He makes you and molds you to the point where you are recognized for what you are and you're not ashamed of. You're not afraid of it anymore. That's what true liberty is. That's what true freedom is, is when you're not afraid. You're no longer ashamed. Until then, you're in bondage to your pride. So am I. So your life and testimony then become stabilized. Isaiah 3, 3 and verse 6 is what we put on those little bumper stickers. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of thy salvation. Your life and testimony is stabilized and it becomes without question to others and to you. So you become a more stable witness for Christ and a more joyous one at that. You have a mission and a goal in life and it counts for the glory of God. That's a great thing. First Thessalonians 3.13 says, To the end that He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of His saints. That's the rapture of the church. Paul wrote in Romans 1.11 that he desired to impart the word so that those believers would be established in the faith. Sterizo. That they'd have a strong resolve. This spiritual confirmation makes the believer cognizant, makes the believer aware by the indwelling spirit that God is with them. And with that, your motivations for serving the Lord are purified. This inspires the believer to keep up the good fight of faith. That's what we all need. Keep up the good fight of faith. Last page of notes here. Strong, subtle believers become such by accepting the undeserved suffering that comes by being, a, being faithful to the Lord. And that's what Peter is trying to build up in these, these believers. He says that he will strengthen and settle you at the end of verse 10. Both of those words, strengthen and settle, are future active indicative verbs. So it's predicated upon, first of all, allowing myself to be perfected and then established. And the result of that is strengthening and settling us down. Confidence. These are actions by which God puts His strength in you where He settles you down. You don't jump when the lion roars now. You just hold your position. God will give you the foundation that will not be shaken. And so we've got to let God work in our lives. When you accept Christ, you pick a team. You pick a side. And you wear their colors. That's the way it is. Spiritual maturity is marked by the believer who recognizes his position in Christ and is at all times listening for the voice of God. Not audibly, but in the Bible and circumstances. And only listening for the purpose of obeying, not arguing. Some believers, they go to church looking for something to argue with. I'm glad we don't have any like that because I'm good at arguing. I don't like it. I get frustrated with it. But sometimes you have to. Um, you have to be an apologist. So we'll put it that way. An apologist, that's what an apology means. Apologia means to argue a point. Sometimes you have to do that, but you do it privately. And you do it in a tone that is edifying rather than de degrading to a person. And I had to do that so many times. And it's okay. It's amazing when God will just calm your spirit down, calm your flesh down, calm your soul down, where you can think and lay out a premise and why you believe what you believe. And I always pop the Bible open and I start going to verses. That's the way to do it. That's, that's the way that I was taught and that's the way that I, I believe that, that we should go. That It's the bread of life that, will, that sustains me and it will sustain that other person as well if they'll just put their faith in it instead of arguing with it. So you recognize your position in Christ and you listen to the sound of the Word of God Jesus said, my sheep follow my voice, the voice of the Word. And so we, we take whatever comes our way and we take it honorably. There are some believers who just get riled about everything, upset about everything. They'll watch the news or they get all upset. they watch this to get all upset, just getting a tizzy. 
No need to be. Sinners are going to sin. I don't know why we're shocked when sinners sin, whether they're the president, vice president, governor. It doesn't make any difference if they're some pop star, some lawmaker, whatever, and they just make this terrible law. Sinners are going to sin. They're trying to decouple from God, as Psalm 2, 1-3 through says. They're trying to decouple from God. They don't want to be associated with a higher power. They think they are the higher power. Until you see the name in the obituary, you've got no more power then. So Peter says in verse 11, To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Of course, that's our Lord. He's God in the flesh. Jesus, we keep referring to, I heard a man saying the other day, well, the Son of God's not God. He's the Son of God. Jesus is as old as the Father. He's eternal. There never was a time when... You, that's a title is what that is. And it's a title to help humanity to understand divinity. There are three in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We'll never see the Holy Spirit, but He's working all the time. Inspiring us all the time. Encouraging us, giving us understanding. Even discipline at times. But the Son, He put a face on God when He came to the earth 2,000 years ago. And sometimes people just think that's too much light for one place. And so they crucified Him. Jesus says, you're my disciples. Don't think you're going to get treated any better than I did. So Peter, and I'm trying to put all of us tonight in the context of what, how these people would have taken this message. Because they were in it. They weren't 2,000 years away from it in a free America. They were in it. It's just if then they were in Afghanistan or somewhere, you know. Peter says that is that is to the Lord be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen, he says. So we are the servants of the Lord God, and it is he to whom we adore and admire, not ourselves. So we take what comes our way, and we take it honorably. It doesn't mean you don't have a right to defend or stand for your rights. That's not the point. The point is, is when you recognize that it's undeserved suffering because of your Christian testimony, then you say, oh, now I understand who's behind this mess. <laughs> then Peter closes with a few remarks regarding some of his fellow workers in the Lord's vineyard. Silvanus, verse 12, A faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. Silvanus is also mentioned in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 19. Also in Acts 15, verses 22 through 27. He was also called Silas. was instrumental in bringing the message of the dispensation of the church age out to the Gentiles. Peter had once failed in this responsibility. And of course the Apostle Paul confronted him face to face on the matter in Galatians 2, 12 through 14. When Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles, he was. But then when the Jews came in, he got up and moved because he was intimidated by the Jewish uh, persons who believed that it was unclean for you to eat with a Gentile who were even saved. I don't care. They're, they might be saved, but they're not as good as us. And Peter gave in to that. And Paul, he dressed him down, as they say in the military. They, he dressed him down. He didn't just shut off his water. He took out his pump. And he humbled Peter. And he did it publicly. Because Peter made a fool out of Jesus Christ publicly. He was weak. He was still giving in to the peer pressure. He was ashamed of the gospel. And Paul says, whoa, 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 whoa. They're equal with us. We don't, we don't call them dogs anymore. They're our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to show the love of Christ to them, not the law of the Jews to them. They already know that. So Peter did all right after that. And this was quite a few years later when he was at the end of his, his service for the Lord. Not too long after the second letter was written, he was crucified himself. So, Peter, being a mature man at this time, towards the end of his life, saw Silvanus as a faithful brother and that the message of the gospel was for all men, Jew and Gentile. So, Silvanus also assisted Paul and Peter in their work. And even though not as well known like so many saints who don't mind, he was glad to be of service to the Lord in a supportive role. You don't get less rewards because you're in a support role. It's like members in a church. You don't get less rewards because you're in a support role. 
You may end up with more because your motivations are more pure. And you'll see that at the Bema seat. No preacher should ever assume that he gets a greater reward when he gets to heaven. There's one reward for the pastor that's not eligible for the rest of the flock that's mentioned in 1 Peter chapter 5. The crown of glory. That's probably a pretty hard one to, to earn. There's other crowns and other rewards. But Peter counted Silvanus as a faithful brother. Silas, whatever. So in verse 13, Paul says, The church that is Babylon as at Babylon, elected together with you, greets you. And so does Mark, my son. The authorized version omits the words in italics. Of course, most of you have that in italics in your version as well. And as such, this translation would read, The elect with you in Babylon salutes you. The believers, in other words. The word church, ecclesia, means those who have been called out. Ek is a prefix preposition meaning out of, and places means to call. So these are people, believers are people, the church is people who have received God's salvation invitation. That's who the church is. The church is not a mass of people that are sitting inside of a building doing a worship service. The only people that are the true church there are those who have received Christ as their Savior. Someone may say, that's a large church, and it might be mostly believers. But it doesn't mean everybody there is a believer. That's just the building where that particular group is meeting. Jesus says, one, one of two are gathered together in my name. I'm in the midst. What else do you want? It's not a trial for American Idol. Not a pastor's not a booking agent to entertain the troops. He's here to help you get ready for your judgment day. That's his job. To help you get ready through your knowledge of the Word so that you live an honorable Christian life. Sometimes you have to suck it up and sometimes you say, I'm glad he was talking to somebody else said to me that time. He must be following me around. No, I definitely don't do that because I don't want you to follow me around. Oh, what you hide? I'm hiding nothing. You don't want to know. But he said, elected with you in Babylon, we salute you and mark my son. And Peter refers to the church from which we believe he wrote this epistle and sending out the call to other believers. The elect are those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. God does not forcefully choose you, make you choose Christ as Savior. He knows those who will and who will not believe. And God knows those who will believe. He knew it in eternity past. There never was a time that God did not know because He's omniscient. It's not like, man, He's shocked that Paul believed, Saul of Tarsus believed, shook, shook God's world. The third heaven just rattled when Saul of Tarsus believed. No, it didn't. God knew that. There never was a time He didn't know it. And God knows that loved one that you pray for all the time whether they're ever going to say yes or no. But you keep praying for them. Try to be a witness. The elect are those who have placed their faith in Christ for their eternal salvation, not their probationary salvation as some teach. Like, well, you've got to stay good or you'll lose it. And there's no such thing as that. The reference here is to all those who have answered the call to faith. Mark was thought to be Peter's spiritual son in the faith, like Timothy is thought to be Paul's spiritual son in the faith, not his actual son, though Peter did have a wife. And some believe he had daughters in extra biblical writings. Mark was thought to be Peter's spiritual son in the faith, and as a younger believer, one who followed as a disciple beside Peter, to learn from Peter. It is said that Mark's gospel is thought to reflect Peter's view of Christ as the servant of the Lord. Last verse. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Be ye with me. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Greet one another with a kiss of love. The word here is agape. Although this practice is not common in the modern world, especially the Western world, it was a common practice in the Eastern world where men still will greet each other with a kiss, sometimes on both cheeks. That was a sign of acceptance. Of course, Judas's was a sign of hypocrisy. You know, when you talk bad about somebody all the way to church and then you shake their hand and smile. 
when you greet them. What? So that's not a good thing. The tire gonna blow out on your way home. No, I just <laughs> <laughs> but the kiss part there was something that was common in the Eastern world, not common in our culture today, and that's probably not the best to do anyway. And we've talked about that before. So today we greet with an extended hand of fellowship and appreciation for the other. We don't we fist bump whatever sometimes. But the usage of love is a copy here refers to a greeting no much, not so much of a fondness. That's phileo. So you shake hands even if you didn't like that other person personally. You shake it out of unconditional love for them for being in your company. You appreciate that and you're showing a sign of hospitality. Shaking the hand is a sign of hospitality, not hostility. Have you ever put your hand out to shake somebody's hand and they wouldn't shake it? I have. What? Yeah. You're not welcome here. <laughs> okay. That happened to me at a funeral one time. Remember, if we want to make friends, we must first show ourselves to be friendly, as Proverbs 18.24 says. So in Christianity, that's a form of hospitality, which we've talked about before. So strong spiritual bonds help hold us together when Satan in the world is trying to pull us apart. So as he says... Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this letter, some of the lessons that we've learned and still have yet to learn. We thank you that you, in your mercy and your grace, uh, you share with us through these writings an insight into how we should live today as you instructed those people like Peter to live in his day when under severe trial, when their faith is being tested. Help us, Heavenly Father, to realize you're not far away. You're right with us, right inside of us. The Spirit of Christ is in us. The Holy Spirit indwells us. Help us to understand that, Father, that you have never forsaken us or abandoned us, and you never will. That once we're in Christ, we're in forever. And we're thankful that you're with us to the end. I'm thankful for the blessings that are awaiting us. And because of that, we will not grow weary in well-doing, as your word says. So help us to be always cognizant of fainting in our minds when we become distressed about our Christian service. To just hang in there. That uh, you've got support on the way. Father, again, thank you for your love and care for us and Jesus Christ who gave his life for us on the cross of Calvary that by merely saying, I know I'm a sinner, I know Jesus died for me on the cross and I accept him as my Lord and my Savior. I believe in three days you had raised him from the dead showing that you accepted his sacrifice for my sin. That when I accept him as my Savior, my name is written in the Lamb's book of life now to be removed not to be blotted out because I'm imperfect. And so we thank you for that, Father. And thank you for all that came out tonight in Christ's name. Amen.